morning, everyone, and welcome again to our conference on deep fakes and the law. My name is Arianne Connell, and I'm a second year student here at NYU Law. I also have the privilege of following Lisa's footsteps as the incoming senior symposium editor for the Journal of Legislation and Public Policy, so I'm really excited to introduce this fireside chat. This discussion will address how terrorist organizations have used and continue to use misinformation and deepfakes to not only advance their own agendas, but also threaten global security and impinge on human rights. We're truly grateful to have Matthew Ferraro guiding this conversation with our amazing panelists as they discuss current efforts, potential solutions, and opportunities for global collaboration to address these concerns. Before they begin, I want to take a moment to thank them all for being here and introduce our moderator, Matthew Ferraro. As an esteemed counsel at Wilmer Hill, he works closely with issues surrounding national security, cybersecurity, and crisis management. And without completely reading off of his bio, I want to highlight that he's a thought leader on the threat that digital disinformation poses to corporations, brands, and markets. Matthew has also written widely on intelligence and national security issues, so I'm sure that everyone will want to check out some of his articles after today's insightful conversation. So now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Matthew Ferraro and our panelists. Thank you, Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Am my levels good? Is that too, that's too loud. All right, how's that? Um, hi, I'm going to make a point of telling my boss that I'm an esteemed Council. I think that's important. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. So I really liked what Judy did in asking the panelists to introduce themselves, so I'm going to copy that. So Emerita Torres, if you could just please introduce yourself and tell us why you're interested in this space. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Or good, I, still, I guess it's still good morning. Emerita Torres, I'm the Director of Policy Research and Programs at the SUFON Center. We're a uh, strategy center focused on the intersection between global security issues and humanitarian issues. And what we seek to do is identify trend lines be before they become fault lines. And we've done this uh, in a couple of ways, looking at the foreign terrorist fighter phenomenon, looking at white supremacy extremism, and most recently, we're looking at disinformation, particularly the security challenges of modern disinformation, which is exactly what this panel is about. Um, I spent 10 years with the State Department as a diplomat. I served in Brazil, Pakistan, Colombia, Washington, DC, and most recently at the US mission to the UN. Thanks. Thank you so much. Munir Ibrahim. Hi, everybody. Monir Ibrahim. I'm Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for Trupic. We are a technology company based in Southern California, and we focus on digital image veracity, specifically through image provenance, uh, which is verifying images and videos at the point of capture when they're actually being created. Uh, prior to this, I was also with the U.S. Department of State. I was actually a colleague of Emerita, uh, and I served in Damascus, Syria, Washington, D.C., uh, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, um, Bogota, Colombia, and the U.S. mission to the United Nations. And it was actually my time as a U.S. diplomat specifically working on the Syrian crisis. That actually led me to technology and specifically image veracity. Uh, which I'm sure we will get into later in the panel. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, all right, well, let's like dive right in. So the, the, the topic of the panel is on uh, terrorism and global implications. So how have states and terrorist organizations used visual disinformation and deepfakes to advance their agendas? And Marita, what do you think? Um, I'll just, and one thing I, I forgot to mention was, uh, so we hosted the Sufan Center a global security forum last year in October looking at the security challenges of modern disinformation. And through that platform, we brought together over representatives from over 70 countries, Madison Avenue, marketing agencies, companies, the technology sector, governments, intelligence, security, to have a conversation like the one we're having right now about how do we combat this threat. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the findings from that conference, as well as some of the, the background that I have, um, particularly serving in Pakistan and looking at uh, the Taliban and the polio eradication mm. uh, that took place there. But what I'll say is, first, the idea, whether we're talking about non-state actors, terrorist organizations, or state actors, the idea is really to stoke fear, division, polarization, and oftentimes violence, and even economic peril, commercial peril. And we'll talk a bit about all of that through, through this uh, panel and to radicalize others to to radicalize individuals to then commit acts of violence or to even continue sharing disinformation um, it's a fault line this nexus between violent extremism terrorism hateful narratives and disinformation 
A couple examples that I'll share. ISIS, the Islamic State, uses disinformation widely. One example is the attack that took place in Las Vegas. This was the most deadliest shooting in modern day US history, right? ISIS claimed that they, they did that attack. That was a lie. Um, but what they did was they spread that narrative, they spread that disinformation across 4chan, 8chan, the news, everyone was picking it up. And so the idea was to stoke fear amongst the American population, amongst the international community, around their ability to conduct these kinds of attacks. And if you are someone who is on 4chan or 8chan looking to become a part of ISIS, that is, that is a model for you. You want to join ISIS after that, right? So that's just one example. Um, I'll turn it to Munir. Specifically, what <clears throat> has concerned me most is the use by state actors of visual disinformation mm -hmm. um, and the interaction of states and multilateral forums and images and videos. Um, specifically, while I was a U.S. diplomat at the U.S. Mission of the United Nations along with Emerita, our jobs were to work in the U.N. Security Council defending the U.S. interests uh, in the UN Security Council. And what we saw, what I saw specifically uh, on the Syrian crisis, was the entrance of videos and images from non-permissive areas, specifically in Syria, entering into the UN Security Council. So what the phenomenon we were seeing was that nation states, multilateral forums, the highest body of international peace and security was making decisions based off of user-generated content. Images and videos captured by everybody's smartphone on the ground in an area in which they cannot access. Mm. It's true, many of these countries, of course, the United States and Security Council members, they have other channels, intelligence channels, and reporting channels that can corroborate or uh, deny information. That usually takes time to work through a bureaucracy when chemical weapons are used and literally within minutes they are hitting social media, mm. the international community has to react. So what I saw there was basically the liar's dividend play out in real life. Mm. And this is what really concerned me. You know, the, uh, Danielle Centrone uh, of Boston University and Bobby Chesney of University of Texas, they far more eloquently than I ever could coined liar's dividend and really wrote about it, but what we saw was literally if you questioned the veracity of images and videos coming into the geopolitical decision-making realm, just questioning their authenticity, mm. you could then undermine the actual events going on the ground and stall international action. Mm. And it was highly, highly effective. Uh, and that is what concerned me most, and I do believe this is something that more nation states will adopt. We've not only seen that in Syria and places like Northern Rakhine State and Burma, uh, the Yemen crisis, we've seen it play out in different areas, Venezuela, where images and videos come out of a non-permissive area, they are undermined. Um, and then, of course, state actors can also use out-of-context images to then push their own narratives. Yeah, it reminds me of an Oxford study, I think, said something like 70 countries now have disinformation capabilities, and you would think that number would just you know, likely go up because it's so cheap, not expensive to do a lot of this. So, I mean, you mentioned, um, did you want to say something, Amir? I just wanted to add the polio. I wanted to do talk it, a little it, bit yeah, so about another non-state actor. Um, so I served in Pakistan and Islamabad uh, around 2012, 2013. Uh, during that time, um, I was a, a health officer and I was working and, and tracking and reporting on Pakistan's anti-polio, polio eradication efforts. At that time, the Pakistani Taliban um, was working, was creating a disinformation campaign around polio eradication efforts. Um, how did they do this? They issued fatwas or religious callings stating that this was a conspiracy campaign, this, that the polio eradication campaign was a conspiracy campaign by the West, by Jews, by Christians to sterilize Muslims in Pakistan. Um, this is a huge issue. Pa Pakistan is one of three countries that still suffers from, from polio. Um, it is an endemic. And that brings us to, to today. Um, last year in, in April, there was a 
fake videos and images and rumors that spread online uh, on the internet regarding children fainting and actually dying from polio vaccinations. Mm. Again, this was, this was a lie. This was debunked by the Washington Post. It was debunked by the government. Uh, it produced mass hysteria. Parents did not want to allow their children to take these vaccinations. Uh, a local news outlet reported that 25,000 children were, were ill in hospitals due to the vaccine. So just gives you an example, health workers were killed. So th the level of disinformation, whether it's a fake video, a fake image, just straight out virulent lies can really have an impact. Would you say there's a distinction between how states use, this inf use disinformation and non-state actors, or is it all sort of the same? I mean, do they have different threats, different capabilities? My sense is, it, ultimately, it is the same motives. Uh, mm -hmm. They are either, in very broad terms, either A, trying to create confusion. Right. And, and this is particularly in the state aspect. If they are denying events happening within their own borders or within the world that somehow threaten their interests, uh, and in Syria particularly, this was highly effective, states were not trying to convince you of their point of view. Mm. They were trying to have you question your points of view. And with confusion ensuing, there is no truth. Mm -hmm. Now, if, with actually pushing out propaganda, I would imagine on the terror side or even on the state actor side, it is more about trying to actually convince someone of a narrative. So if they're defending, I think it's kind of undermining all information. Mm -hmm. If they're on the offensive, they're probably trying to relay a point. And just to add to that on the, on the state actor side, I mean, I know Russia was probably mentioned a couple of times today, right. um, but their, the level of their disinformation campaigns are industrialized. I mean, right. it, is, it, is a, it is a sector for them. So the level to which they're able to uh, create these campaigns, carry them out, measure how effective they are, I think that there's a bit of a difference, especially now um, you know, with ISIS and Al-Qaeda, particularly ISIS has been you know, territorially defeated, but their disinformation campaigns and their, their narratives still live on, um, whether it's through the dark web, even, I mean, I think companies like Facebook and Twitter have taken, you know, necessary steps to, to take down some of their content, but then you have 4chan, 8chan, some of these underground, less known um, companies, Telegram, WhatsApp, that are, you know, taking strides, but not at the same rate that some of these larger companies are. And if they're just sharing among like text messages or WhatsApp with friends, it's not it's not sort of this mass online uh, manipulated sentiment. So so we've talked a lot about regular sort of visual disinformation or just disinformation. Um, how is this going to turn out as you know deep fake synthetic media become more commoditized? Well, I think um, one thing is you know we we hosted this conference and. According to some of the data points we found in terms of the commercial fallout, um, a, you know, a cyber attack related to disinformation um, will cost you know close to six billion dollars in corporate losses. Mm. These kinds of cyber attacks. Six so billion. six billion, excuse me, six yeah. billion dollars. So in terms of the commercial fallout of, of this crisis, whether we're talking deep fakes, synthetics, the the, the commercial problem here is huge for companies in terms of brand management, in terms of credibility, reliability, and when, when these sorts of attacks happen, an individual is not going to look to the other individual or the group that caused it. They're going to look to the company. I, I would just add that um, thus far, and I think several people have already noted this, cheap fakes are the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are these rudimentary uh, manipulations to standard images that are the real problem right now. Good question, how, do, how does the proliferation of GANs and deepfakes actually make that worse? And I think it's just gonna move along the spectrum uh, and exacerbate the current problem. I also believe that different societies will be affected at different rates. Uh, and you can kind of see that with cheap fakes already. Uh, you know, highly dense societies uh, with existing societal fissures, religious right. fissures, sectarian fissures, might be more susceptible and vulnerable to reactions from deep fakes or cheap fakes uh, than maybe other societies. So uh, I can see it only exacerbating the current problem at faster speeds and perhaps even with more violence and other negative reactions. Well, this is depressing. Um, <laughs> 
can we talk solutions? Like, wh wh where do the solutions lie? Is this going to be you guys both? You've worked at the UN. Is it at the UN or sort of a, a super national body? Is it it's the state system? How do we actually push back on this this dangerous threat? Well, I think what's important first is that this is a problem that cannot be solved by the government alone. I think we think a lot about policy, government policy, legislation. Ninety percent of uh, cyber infrastructure is owned by the private sector. So if that's the case, the private sector needs to be an absolute part of this solution. Technology companies, um, media agencies, governments, et cetera. And I think we need to have a multi-stakeholder comprehensive approach to, to this. Um, legislation is certainly a part of it. Regulation is certainly a part of it. I think that uh, techn technology companies need to be at the center. Um, one interesting example at the United Nations, it's the uh, global the global counterterrorism forum, uh, the global internet GIF CT. We work in acronyms, GIF CT. Um, it's a conglomeration conglomerate of companies that work together to take down content. Facebook, Twitter, other companies are a part of it. I think that's an interesting sort of forum to have these sort of discussions, and perhaps that can be broadened to include this information. What do you think? To, to echo Emerita's point, um, the term we, we often use, it's going to be kind of a whole of society approach. I mean, we are technologists, and we do not believe technology is going to solve this answer. Mm. Uh, we think that it is going to be a holistic uh, coming together of a variety of areas. You know, Catherine has laid out the very different areas that really need to, to focus on this, everything ranging from technologists, legislators, uh, educators, psychosocial behavior is a big part of this. One of the things that we are particularly excited about is we have partnered up with Qualcomm Technologies. Um, and what we are trying to do is embed point of image verification, mm. uh, controlled capture is what we call it, verification at point of creation, technology directly into the hardware of smartphones. Mm. And we believe that is a way in which you can scale image provenance globally through actual smartphone proliferation. We think that this is, uh, could be a very critical key, yeah. not a silver bullet. Uh, we have been involved with Adobe's content authenticity initiative, we think is a great uh, step forward, uh, and there's so many other good initiatives. One, raise awareness, and two, bring together the different parts of society to begin developing a foundation and then open standards that right. can be deployed across the internet. Oh yeah, go ahead. Just to add, um, media literacy I think is crucial in this conversation. Um, during the conference, we learned uh, that the Swedish civil service has trained 13,000 of their civil servants on how to understand disinformation, how to combat disinformation. I think this needs to be happening across governments. Also, Ukraine, um, I believe they have a curriculum in their public school system around disinformation. So these are the kinds of approaches we should be taking, whether it's at the national level, at the international level. I think there's a lot we can learn from other countries who are trying to combat this threat. Yeah, it's interesting, because it seems to me that we should start with the idea of like what su success looks like. And it seems that success is both like fewer deep fakes, I suppose, but also just a greater sense of kind of immunity in the, eco in the ecosystem to them. So that in the same way, like think of spam email. We all get you know, millions of spam emails, but we're now trained to overlook them, uh, unless you know, you're, you're like my parents or something. You know? <laughs> so um, so I, it, it seems to me that it's right. Like, there's literacy. There's knowing to look at the provenance of a photo, um, perhaps trusting uh, a, 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 a real journalistic outfit that would do the sorts of things that they were discussing in the previous panel to ensure the accuracy of the photographs. And that, that'll seem to be part of the solution because you're not going to get the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think what we face as well in, when we think about journalism is like a, a crisis of credibility mm -hmm. and a lack, like a lack of trust in some of what we're seeing in the news. And I think we should be building a level of community resilience around this information. Right. And again, I think it needs to be multi-sectoral. There needs to be different pieces of this. So with something just off of that, I mean, you know, a lot of the examples that you guys used are societies that are already sort of riven. And I guess I'm just curious, is it simply that there's gonna be less resiliency in those sorts of societies where they're gonna be, you know, non-permissive areas like Munir was talking about in Syria or areas like Pakistan where conspiracy theories tend to run pretty rampant? Um, 
yeah, I mean, maybe the question begs the answer, but is it, is it the kind of thing where it can, res resilience can scale even in sort of weak states? I mean, I think that's a difficult question. Um, you know, the first example I think about is India. You know, you have the, the largest democracy right. in terms of people, right? Um, but there's an example in 2018, 30 people were, were killed in a, in a mob lynching based on a rumor that circulated on WhatsApp. Yeah, so, I mean, and if you think about villages in India or, or you know, um, other, other countries with villages where all you have is a smartphone, mm -hmm. like your source of information is your smartphone. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to combat disinformation when that's the only access that you have. So, I don't know, that, that doesn't answer your question. No, I think Just I, makes people more depressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we knew what you got. Optimistically, yes, I do think resiliency can scale. It's going to take time. This is going to be the heavy lifting that the international community will have to do, along with technology companies. Uh, I think the U.S. government and Western governments are going to have to put increased funding mm -hmm. on programs, on uh, uh, educational programs specifically in areas that are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think uh, uh, I think uh, Emerita mentioned uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has some of the foremost thinkers mm -hmm. on how to counter disinformation, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually took part in a State Department program to do so uh, in Cyprus last year, and it was really incredible seeing some of the things that people in Eastern Europe, specifically in Ukraine, were working on. Mm -hmm. So I think it can scale, um, but I think it's going to have to be through this whole of society approach. Right. Uh, well, that's actually a good pivot because we've talked a lot about disinformation in the political sphere, uh, and I know that the commercial sphere is an area that's near and dear to all of our hearts. So just general open question, how, will, how does disinformation and deep fakes pose a threat to commercial and private sector interests? <clears throat> How are those going to be evolving globally, and what can we do about them? Well, um, I mentioned, sorry, I, I jumped ahead, um, and I talked a little bit about... Um, preview, you give a preview. A little preview. Yeah. But again, there's so much, uh, so much corporate loss um, as a result of disinformation in, in the corporate world. I, I was reading an article this week about a disinformation campaign with Starbucks, um, and it was related to, a, I believe, a white supremacist who said something along the lines of, we, are, uh, we understand that Starbucks is providing free coffee to undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. And that, again, it stirs fear, it stirs... Uh, a, a, no pun, it stirs coffee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Huh, I, didn't, I didn't realize I did that. Um, but anyway, it stirs fear, it's divisive, um, and, and I think that you know, Starbucks, I think immediately you know, debunked it, but once that rumor is around, how do you, how do you counter that? Do you counter it, you know, viral truth versus a viral lie, et cetera? Um, it's a good question, and, and we have seen, you know, in certain uh, private sector verticals, uh, some verticals are much quicker at picking up uh, and understanding the need for verified imagery uh, for their business operations, and some are much slower. And, uh, you know, I think there is a growing need across all private sector verticals to have high trust in the images and videos they're seeing. Right. If you think about how we interact, how we shop, how we date, how we get any level of information, there is an increasing use of images and videos, specifically user-generated content. Uh, and that, as business operations start integrating UGC into their own processes, they're going to need to figure out ways to have higher trust, not only for themselves, but for the content consumers on the other side. We've seen uh, Airbnb, we have seen uh, eBay, we've seen so many different organizations have issues around image veracity, of course, many online dating sites. So I think some, many understand the issues ahead, I think some are slower to introduce new practices into their operating environments until it actually shakes uh, or threatens uh, profits. Right, I, I completely agree. I think we saw this a lot with cybersecurity now. All companies have cybersecurity plans about hacking and so forth, but they really didn't do that at scale until people really started losing money. Uh, and I, and I, have, I have to say, I think something similar is gonna happen with this information. You know, I just want to go back real quick to something that you said or ask you to explicate a little bit more. When you talk about image veracity, look, what does that mean to the layperson? Is there going to be a bug or a symbol at the bottom of the image to show that it's up on the blockchain? Or how would we see that now as, 
as consumers, we want to be educated consumers, we want to be informed consumers of imagery, what should we be looking for? It's a great question. And uh, the answer is it, it's, it's very challenging to, okay. to really, what convinces you that an image is real? That might be different to what convinces me mm. what an image is real. And, uh, and then the question of real is another big question. I think you know, there's a lot of experts uh, that are, are working through behavioral psychology to actually try and get to the root of that. Mm -hmm. um, when we say, as Trupic say, high trust imagery, we, we discuss images with known provenance. Mm -hmm. um, when we say provenance, we think time, date, location, and pixelation. Mm -hmm. If you can have a high level of trust that those four inputs are the originals captured from the point of capture, from the millisecond someone snapped that on their smartphone, mm. and you could preserve that immutably, that information, no matter where that image travels through the internet, that, in our opinion, is a high trust image. But we recognize there is so much more that goes into it that is far out of what a technologist might think. Um, you know, many critics, and we've actually seen this in the uh, international space where an image of some horrific atrocity takes place in some country where people might say, okay, the picture is real, but how do I know people were not paid to lie down on the floor and you know, put red paint on their face? Mm. There's always gonna be a level of cynicism right. that will be candidly impossible to shake, but mitigating that as best you can through provenance could be a helpful way to move forward. And add, add, add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you mentioned um, the, the like imagery and, and its ability to 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 spread. I think you know one example in the in the ter in the terrorism context, for example, ISIS in Libya, um, they they claim to have conquered a city in Dern uh, with a hundred thousand people along the Mediterranean coast, um, and they took a picture of of themselves um, by by the city. But that was also a lie. Um, and they were able to spread some of these uh, images that they took. And they were able to, again, stoke fear, recruit, et cetera. So I think um, overall, just to contribute to the, counter, to the terrorism side, I think it's a real problem that we face. Yeah, I mean, it occurs to me that you know, disinformation and uh, photo manipulation dates from like you know, the Stalinist era and so forth. But I just feel like now people are so coached to believe whatever it is that they want. Uh, through their own political leaders or whatnot, uh, I, I do see it as a serious problem, and it's part of it is I think the breakdown of just social trust in any major institution. And the the good news is that we can all be part of rebuilding trust. Mm. Uh, you were looking you want to say something? No, I think um, my personal view. I, I think there's a breakdown in critical analysis and critical thinking. Mm. Um, so many people are tied to their smartphone, and when they want an answer to something, they Google it, and they think that the Google answer is just is right. And I think that's a big problem. We're not questioning enough. We're not thinking enough. Mm. And I think we need to really consider how we're educating ourselves and the sources of our education. Yeah. Anything to say on that, Manu? No, I, I mean, I would agree. I, I would add that, you know, one, th there's several ways I think this can, ultimate solutions and mitigation techniques can be pushed forward. And the one thing I think is that uh, governments will not have the problem, uh, will not have the solution and legislators will not, but they can help bring together the forums to do that and help create. Um, one, one particular body I often think of is the G7. Um, all those countries have the resources and have the interest to actually bring together uh, uh, policymakers, thinkers, technologists, uh, you know, uh, different forums uh, that are trying to piece together the foundation and the solutions. And I think that would be one of the ways forward. Very helpful. Um, all right, perhaps we could, oh, we've got some time for questions. Who has questions? Yes, sir, right here. Uh, there's one that's slowly wending its way to you. Uh, I guess first I would say, Photo manipulation goes back to the beginning of photographs, back in the Civil War. And on that note, in the beginning of the internet, um, Google was supposedly doing peer review to make sure that the results were effective. But there was massive amounts of fraud, and they, make a ton they made a ton of money, but maybe nobody noticed because it was just money that was being lost. It seems to be there's a, sen a, a huge change in like 2017 where Facebook, implicated in genocide in Myanmar, the CSO himself said to the journalists, you don't understand the problem 
journalists on the ground reporting the genocide. He undermined them, saying, you don't understand what's going on. Mm. We have to be sure we don't become Orwellian and overregulate. And then again, when Singapore said to Facebook, you know, you have to have veracity of your information, they said again, we have to make sure we don't overregulate. So I wonder if the issue is that we're treating misinformation, the opposite of it, as just information, not a set of values such as liberty or justice. So when Facebook says or Google says we don't want to overregulate, what they should really be saying is we want to work towards justice, we want to work towards liberty as a shared value. Got it. All right, who wants to take that? I would jump in and say absolutely, and, and candidly, I don't think any technology company should be the arbiter of truth. Uh, certainly not mine and, and certainly not any. What I think technology companies should strive to do is provide the most information in the most palatable and understandable form to content consumers so that decisions can be made based off of those images. Uh, certainly not undermine people on the ground um, reporting that information. If I can just add, I mean, I agree, I agree with you. I think, um, so Microsoft presented at our conference last year, and they talked about a partnership that they have with NewsGuard. I'm not sure if you're familiar with NewsGuard, but one thing that they do is similar to what you're saying, is they put together, I think, a set of nine values, and they, mm. and they observe different news websites based on those nine values. And so they're essentially grading um, news companies on how their ability to, to have integrity, credibility, the veracity, to the extent that they could of, of their news. That's really interesting, I didn't hear that. All right, next question. Come on, anybody? Yes, sir, over here. I was being pointed, I have no idea who's raised their hand. All right, we're gonna go with this gentleman here, and then I'll find Thank the you. person. I, I was wondering about the uh, criminalization, and uh, is there any way to cap capture, make this like a crime that people could go to jail for, basically? fake uh, videos, and what about the possible solution of bonds, that whoever loads up a video has to be bonded, that if something goes wrong as a f fake video, they would suffer economic loss. Huh, all right, what do you guys think? Criminalization or economic loss penalties? I mean, I think that disinformation, you know, we think about it in the electoral context, but there's also criminal fraud, cryptocurrency, like there's a lot in there in terms of financial crimes that we should be looking at. Um, so I think there are certainly ways to do it. Um, I'm not a criminalization expert, but I will say that, that they're on, the, on the economic and the criminal side, there's certainly ways, ways to do that. Uh, I would add, um, Matthew is the lawyer on the stage and will probably have uh, thoughts yeah. on this. Um, what I have been uh, told is one area in terms of legal uh, rethink would be uh, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230 mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. which several legal experts have discussed uh, helps create some liability on social media platforms. Um, and then uh, one thing I would also add though is malicious actors are going to figure out ways to upload images and, and deceptive content anonymously. Mm -hmm. So it would be very, very hard to actually identify the perpetrator. Uh, and what you'll be left with is the people who are resharing this image, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and it'd be hard to criminalize that. Yeah, I would just add to that to say that, uh, one, there's major jurisdictional problems, especially in the international context, right? So the U.S. might have a series of laws, a body of law, but it's really can not go very far if the perpetrator is overseas and outside the writ of the court. There are uh, you'll hear more about it in the next panel. There's three laws now in the books in Texas and Virginia and California that, that prohibit various kinds of deep fakes and synthetic harm. Uh, as far as I know, none has been successfully used and they're pending now in nine other states and there are five bills pending in Congress. So there's a, attempts. I will say that I think that not, not all uh, speech is protected, right? I mean, you can't manipulate a stock with your speech, right? Like that is a restraint on speech. You'd be prosecuted by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, defamation is another one. Copyright, trademark violations. What Emma Rita talked about that it's a, a well-known case of Starbucks being the victim of disinformation. The, the um, Starbucks could have plainly brought a copyright claim because the person was misusing their mark or trademark claim, uh, but they didn't because it wasn't worth it. So there are avenues, but I think in, in, it's much larger than anything any law can prohibit. All right, we had other questions. Yes, sir, right here. So I have a question about essentially who is supposed to pay for this? So, so for example, broadly speaking, we have two categories of solutions. One is based on task analysis. Oh, they're, they're passing you a microphone. Yeah, let me just repeat. Yeah. 
So the broad question is, who is supposed to pay for, for the detection techniques? Broadly speaking, we have two categories, one which is fully passive, where we just analyze statistically whatever, whatever happens to be out there. And the second approach is the one that you're trying to go to. So can we introduce something at the smartphone level to, to help with the detection? And there's been a lot of research in the second category as well, mainly in the, in the first decade of the century. But the problem was that there were no incentives for the camera vendors to introduce those solutions to the market. So the question would be, uh, what's your take on who is supposed to pay for this technology? Is it end users? Is it platforms? Should this, should this be something that should be enforced by regulations? I'm wondering what, what's your take on this? Thank you. I guess uh, Munir would probably best it for that one. Sure, uh, great question. Um, you know, figuring out the, uh, the business and uh, uh, productizing of, of verified imagery is an interesting question, and it's one that you know, we have been thinking about for quite a bit of time, and it changes. Um, candidly, and I think you noted this, uh, maybe five years ago, the, the, the cost of a verified imagery was not worth it for a lot of vendors, for a lot of consumers, and I think that is rapidly changing. Um, I think by uh, working with actual hardware and putting them into actual smartphones and OEMs, now it becomes a feature set of smartphones moving forward. And now that feature set can be then leveraged by a variety of different applications, platforms, uh, commerce sites. So I think that is a way in which you can move forward. All right. Well, with that, please join me in thanking Emirate Amir.